Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson, and I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases, especially written for people learning English. You will hear stories from Mario Ritter Jr. and Jill Robbins. Dan Novak presents this week's education report, and John Russell brings us today's lesson of the day. But first, Mario Ritter Jr. looks at the complex recovery efforts following a landslide in Papua New Guinea. Officials in Papua New Guinea (PNG). Have ordered people in parts of Enga Province to leave their homes because of the continuing danger of landslides. The government estimates that the collapse of a mountainside buried at least two thousand people on Friday. Officials said the likelihood of finding survivors is small. That number. Is higher than an earlier estimate from the United Nations, which placed possible deaths at 670. An estimated 150 structures were buried in the landslide. Rescue teams have been slow to arrive. Heavy rain and tribal unrest. Have delayed aid supplies and the heavy equipment needed to dig into the earth. The UN International Organization for Migration (IOM) said a bridge to the area had collapsed, forcing aid vehicles to travel farther. A military escort has guarded groups of rescue vehicles. Because of the unrest, a continuing deadly tribal conflict has made it more difficult for aid workers to get to the area. Local people have used hand tools to search for survivors. Sandis Saka is a provincial administrator and heads a disaster committee. He told Reuters that conditions remain dangerous. The landslide area is very unstable, he said. There are still rocks and debris coming down. Tsaka also said the military had set up security stops and is moving people to evacuation centers. The UN said on Tuesday that six bodies had been recovered so far. The UN estimated the total number of those affected to be seven thousand eight hundred forty-nine. Nicholas Booth is a representative of the UN Development Program. He said the aid operation. Is very complex because the landslide area is increasing. It means that now the area that's been affected by the landslide is greater than it was at the beginning. We don't know how it will develop, but that's the nature of the geology in PNG. Booth also spoke about the tribal violence. He said eight people were killed and thirty houses burned in fighting on Saturday. Itai Viriri of the IOM spoke in Geneva. Viriri said aid teams need to be careful to prevent another disaster, saying. All response efforts have to be done in a very careful manner. On Tuesday, the UN said that immediate needs include clean water, 
food preparation tools, medicine, and psychological and social support. A UN statement said provincial officials in New Guinea have asked the international community to send engineers to study geological dangers in the area. Officials said the difference in the estimated number of dead is the result of the difficulty the country has in counting its population. The nation's last credible population count, or census, was in 2000. A 2022 list of registered voters for the area does not include people under the age of 18. Booth said estimates should be treated with great caution. He said it's just not possible at this stage to make a very scientific, verified estimate. Booth added, but it's going to be a very high number of casualties. We have to be prepared for that. I'm Mario Ritter, Jr. Eastern American state of Massachusetts, people are combining a form of exercise for the body and spirit with pigs. The yoga classes in Massachusetts are selling out within hours. People come from far away to exercise with Wilbur, Charlotte, and Bluey, who are piglets or young pigs. The pigs come from a nearby farm to play among people in the yoga class at Ashley Bousquet's business, Beyond Yoga and Wellness, in the town of Spencer. Bousquet tells people not to worry if piglets climb on top of them or want to cuddle. Yoga classes with animals are not new. Goats might have been the first. Lainey Morse started yoga classes with goats in the state of Oregon in 2016. She found she felt happier and more at ease around goats. She talked with a friend who was a yoga teacher. They decided to offer classes with the goats. Their business was successful, and the idea soon spread to other places. In Ashley Bousquet's class, the little pigs walk around humans who are moving into exercise positions called downward dog, crow, and cobra. Among the other animals in the outdoor class are two rabbits and a goat named Munchie. Stacy Delbridge and her daughter drove almost two hours to attend a class with the pigs. She said it was worth the drive. The best thing about the piglet yoga was, of course, the piglets and how cute they are, Delbridge said with a smile. They were funny, you know. Just when you were getting to a point where you needed a break, you had a great visitor come see you, and you could quit without looking like a quitter. Yeah, they're adorable. Bousquet said there is such demand that online registrations are usually full within hours. The classes begin with Bousquet inviting her students not to worry about stopping their exercises to spend time with the piglets. During the class, you have piglets causing mischief and running on you, on top of you, or cuddling with you, Bousquet said. It's super cute. Amy Finkel brought her two daughters with her, smiling while taking photos of piglets as the girls held a rabbit. The highlight of the class, in my opinion, was just having them run around and seeing them so joyful and happy, she said. The only problem was that the time passed too quickly. Doing yoga with animals produces good results. Rebecca Purchase is a volunteer coordinator of the Massachusetts Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, ANGEL. If animal yoga includes shelter or unwanted animals, 
It may even encourage people to give them a home, she said. Is yoga stressful to animals that join? It can be, if it's not the right animal, Purchase said. For animals that really thrive being around people and getting to socialize with them, it absolutely can be a benefit. I'm Jill Robbins. Before we hear today's education report, Dan Novak joins me to introduce the topic and to explain some of the words and phrases you will hear. Hi, Dan. Welcome. Hi, Ashley. Today's report is about the Brown v. Board of Education, a landmark case that was decided 70 years ago. The case is famous for striking down school segregation and the separate but equal doctrine. For listeners who don't know much about this, can you explain what separate but equal and segregation mean? Sure. So to segregate something means to set apart from a group or to isolate or divide. To segregate in this context means to divide based on race or class. Before 1954, it was legal to keep schools separate based on race. In many parts of the U.S. at that time, and especially in the South, virtually every part of society was segregated. Blacks and whites even used separate water fountains and bathrooms. So, separate but equal was the legal justification for segregation. It was established in the Plessy v. Ferguson case in the late 1800s, which ruled that segregation was constitutional. The court ruled that segregation could be legal as long as the facilities for each race were equal. This, of course, could never be possible. And in the report we are about to hear, you say there is now school segregation in a de facto way. Can you explain what you mean by that? Sure. So, segregating students based on race is illegal and has been since the Brown ruling. But segregation remains, even if it is not by law. Many American cities, for example, are highly divided on class and race lines. So many school districts, which are based on geography, are also segregated. De facto is Latin and means in fact. So schools are now segregated in fact, but not in law as they were before 1954. Okay, thanks for answering those questions, Dan. Now, let's listen to today's education report. May 17th marked the 70th anniversary of one of the most notable cases in U.S. Supreme Court history, Brown v. Board of Education. The 1954 decision declared segregated schools unconstitutional. It also struck down the principle of separate but equal, which was used as the basis for U.S. government's policies related to racial segregation. President Dwight Eisenhower famously sent federal troops to southern states to enforce the decision. Today, American schools cannot legally restrict students based on race. But because of long-held economic divides and other issues, some schools have become segregated in a de facto way. Some researchers say that despite the continuing ban, school segregation has gotten worse over the years, even as the U.S. overall has become more racially diverse. A team from the University of California, Los Angeles, or UCLA, recently released a report examining the ways segregation has changed in U.S. schools. The report is called The Unfinished Battle for Integration in a Multiracial America, From Brown to Now. It was written by two UCLA professors, Gary Orfield and Ryan Flager. The study found that schools have gotten less white and more Latino, Asian, and multiracial. But it also noted the number of schools considered intensely segregated tripled from 1988 to 2021. The study defined intensely segregated as schools with white students' populations of less than 10%. 
about 20% of American schools are intensely segregated, up from 7% in 1988, the report found. The study's writers state that schools of the South are dramatically less segregated than the apartheid conditions that had always existed before Brown. However, Orfield and Flager add that the Supreme Court's decision's historic aims have not been attained, and, as this report shows, we have been moving backward. The researchers found that black and Latino students were the most highly segregated populations. In 2021, schools overall were 45% mostly white. But on average, black students attended schools that were about 76% non-white. For Latino students, the school average was about 75% non-white. Education experts say segregation especially hurts black and Latino schools. This is because they are often underfunded and have higher rates of teacher shortages. Non-white school districts receive $23 billion less funding than mostly white school districts, a 2019 report by the nonprofit group EdBuild found. The trends are toward increasing double segregation by both race or ethnicity and poverty, the UCLA study said. Researchers at another California university, Stanford, found that schools are getting more segregated even as neighborhoods have gotten more diverse and racial economic inequality has improved. The findings indicate that policy choices, not demographic changes, are driving the increase, said Sean Reardon. He is a professor at Stanford who specializes in how poverty and inequality affects education. The UCLA study noted that desegregation policies following the Brown decision were generally aimed at improving access to schools for black students. But 70 years later, the issue of school segregation has gotten more complex. Latinos now make up the largest U.S. minority group, and the Asian population has also grown. Most Americans of all racial groups think integrated schools are better, but are divided about what, if anything, to actually do, the UCLA study states. The researchers offered several suggestions for improving integration. One is for districts to increase efforts to register students from poorer areas and offer more diverse school programs. A 2018 article by the nonprofit group Edutopia described how some school districts have been successful in improving integration. In Cambridge, Massachusetts, for example, every school must have a balance of wealthier and poorer families. In San Antonio, Texas, Bilingual schools and other specialized programs have brought in students from many different backgrounds. And in New York City, schools have made progress by removing standardized testing requirements. Others introduced admittance systems that take into account whether a student is poor, homeless, or a non-native English speaker. American schools have been moving away from the goal of Brown and creating more inherently unequal schools for a third of a century, writers of the UCLA study wrote. It will soon become understood once more that schools that serve all children together with equity are central to any good outcomes. I'm Dan Novak. Next report, Mario Ritter Jr. tells us about changes in world trade. We learn about how U.S.-China trade disagreements have had an effect on Vietnam. Pay careful attention to the word surge. We will talk more about it after the report. As the United States increases tariffs to reduce trade with China, 
it has greatly increased imports from Vietnam. The Southeast Asian country, however, depends on China for much of its exports to the U.S. The Reuters news agency recently studied information from the World Bank and economic experts. It shows that the value of China's exports to Vietnam almost matches the value of exports from Vietnam to the U.S. in recent years. Last year, the U.S. imported over $114 billion of goods from Vietnam. That was more than two times more than 2018, when U.S.-China trade disputes began. That increase happened as U.S. imports from China dropped by $110 billion. Hung Nguyen is an expert in supply chains or networks of product suppliers with RMIT University Vietnam. He said that in important industries such as clothing and electronic equipment, Vietnam captured more than 60% of China's loss. However, data show that much of Vietnam's exports to the U.S. are parts or components produced in China. The Asian Development Bank estimates that imported parts account for 80% of the value of Vietnam's electronic exports in 2022. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development said in a report that 90% of goods imported by Vietnam's electronics and clothing industries in 2020 were then embodied in exports. That number, the organization said, was higher than in earlier years and far above the average in industrialized countries. In the first three months of 2024, U.S. imports from Vietnam added up to $29 billion, while Vietnam's imports from China totaled $30.5 billion. Darren Tay is the lead economist at the research company BMI. He said, The surge in Chinese imports in Vietnam, coinciding with the increase in Vietnamese exports to the U.S., may be seen by the U.S. as Chinese firms using Vietnam to skirt the additional tariffs imposed on their goods. He noted that could lead to tariffs against Vietnam after the U.S. presidential elections. Vietnam now has the fourth largest trade surplus with the U.S. That surplus is only smaller than the ones the U.S. has with China, Mexico, and the European Union. The growing trade imbalance comes as Vietnam seeks market economy treatment from the United States. U.S. President Joe Biden has pushed to increase diplomatic ties. The U.S. Embassy in Hanoi did not comment on trade imbalances. Vietnam's foreign and trade ministries did not answer requests for comment, and China's Commerce Ministry did not immediately answer a request for comment from Reuters. The increase in China-Vietnam-U.S. trade 
takes place as investments in Southeast Asian countries rise. Companies involved in the area are moving some of their activities from China. Many Chinese companies set up new factories in Vietnam, but they still heavily depend on supplies from their homeland. After a 2023 investigation, the U.S. Commerce Department found that some of the trade was just a way to place Made in Vietnam on finished solar panels to avoid tariffs. Another reason Vietnam is getting U.S. attention is its involvement in the Xinjiang area in China. The U.S. bans imports from the area over accusations of human rights violations against minority Uyghurs. Xinjiang is China's main producer of cotton and polysilicon, a material used to make solar panels. Both are important to Vietnamese industries. Vietnam's clothing and solar panels accounted for about 9% of exports to the U.S. last year. Vietnam passed China as the main exporter of products covered by the Xinjiang ban last year, said Hong Nguyen of RMIT. The Biden administration has remained quiet about Vietnam's large trade surplus. Some experts say that may change after the November elections in the U.S. Nguyen Ba Hung is an economist at the Asian Development Bank. He said it is possible that whoever wins may change the policy towards Vietnam, but that would also risk increasing U.S. import costs. I'm Mario Ritter, Jr. Before the report, we asked you to pay careful attention to the word surge. Can you remember when you heard it? You heard the term used in a quote from Darren Tay, an economist. Let's listen again. He said, The surge in Chinese imports in Vietnam, coinciding with the increase in Vietnamese exports to the U.S., may be seen by the U.S. as Chinese firms using Vietnam to skirt the additional tariffs imposed on their goods. In our example, surge is a noun. We spell it like this, S-U-R-G-E. A surge is a large, sudden increase. You will often see the term used in news stories about business or the economy. For example, you might hear about a surge in trade, a surge in unemployment, a surge in debt levels, and so on. Please note that surge also has a verb form that is also commonly used. The verb form requires a slightly different sentence structure. For example, you might use the verb surge like this. Unemployment has surged in recent months. Or you might use the noun form of surge like this. There has been a surge in unemployment in recent months. The two sentences have almost the exact same meaning. And that's the lesson of the day. I'm John Russell. And that's our program for today. 
Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories from around the world.